what do you think were the highlights and lowlights of the testimonies today? Well, uh, I'd say the highlights were the people on our side. I thought that our, there was four people on our side, and they all did a good job. Uh, there was two professors, Professor Flynn at, at American University and Professor uh, Raghavan at uh, University of uh, uh, Oklahoma were there at the law school, and they did a really good job. And then I thought that P uh, Peter Merbrook from Public Citizen did a good job. And, and you know, I, I, I felt very good about our testimony. So I thought that that was a high point. I thought the, uh, the worst part of it, of course, for our point of view, is when people attacked India for granting compulsory license on really expensive cancer drug, or they attacked India for not granting enough patents on cancer drugs. I mean, India right now is the place that uh, is the main source of inexpensive, affordable medicines for cancer and for other illnesses. And uh, if, if, if the U.S. government continues to put pressure on India so that it, it can't make those drugs available or limits their activities in that area, it's just going to kill a lot of poor people. Um, Susan Wilson today mentioned that after this 301 process, they're going to be reviewing the whole process in terms of how they do it and what's involved in its legality. Um, do you have any thoughts on that or if you know, we're going to participate in that uh, review later on this year? Well, it's kind of remarkable that here we are in 2014 and they're just now, I mean, Obama was elected in 2008 and here, um, like years later, six years later, we're, we're talking about maybe this list has something wrong with it. This list was really created in 1989 to put pressure on India and other countries to allow them to accept intellectual property rights in the WTO. It was, there was a lot of resistance to even have an intellectual property in any trade agreement back in the 80s. And this was, this is, if you go back that far, that's why this list was created in the first place. Now, uh, you've now got the WTO agreement in hand. You've got a lot of other trade agreements as well. So you have to kind of wonder, and a lot of the witnesses brought this up, what is really the, the jurisdiction of this, of this uh, group of um, uh, bureaucrats working in Washington, D.C. to be telling, telling governments around the world what kind of uh, policies you should have on patents and copyrights. It's uh, antiquated in a lot of ways, but it's, um, it's, it's still there, and it's a very uh, visible part of the uh, foreign policy of the United States right now. Uh, recently, there have been quite a few government hearings that have um, had a lot to do with Indian trade policy and policies in India. Uh, what do you think about this recent kind of uptick in pressure on India? I think all the pressure in India is based on what they initially did on the area of cancer drugs. By, I mean, first, first there was this Gleevec, uh, Gleevec case populating along that attracted a lot of attention. And the Gleevec case was... Uh, you know, in a, in a way, it was it's, it's 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 kind of odd that that would become the, f the flashpoint or the focus of so much attention because uh, Gleevec was a product that was in, uh, put in the market in the 90s, and the WTO agreement didn't go into effect. Uh, the, the patent obligations on India didn't go into effect till 2005. So, Gleevec had long been available as a generic drug in India. It was really basically an older drug when they passed their, their patent law. So the argument that Norvatus made about Gleevec was they should be able to patent Gleevec even though it wasn't a new invention just because they hadn't had a, a patent in India before. And uh, I think most people thought it was a fairly weak case from a legal point of view. But it drew attention to the fact that it's harder to get a patent in India on an old drug than it is, for example, in the United States. And, and uh, so that was part of it. The other part was that the, the uh, Indian government overrode the patent on a Bayer drug, Nexavar, which was really an expensive drug in India for liver cancer, over $60,000 a year in India. And uh, those two cases together, uh, what I really think what began people looking at India. The other thing is that are these concerns people have that India is going to use its intellectual property laws, its patent laws, to say that you have to manufacture things in India in order to get patent protection. And because that, that section of the patent law doesn't really apply to medicine, but it could apply to anything. It could, could apply to semiconductors. It could apply to uh, uh, clean energy technology, pretty much anything. 
I think there's a uh, what what you saw was you know a, a lot of companies gathering together to really focus on on that local working issue. Now the thing is it becomes complicated because there these cases are are coming about in the context of cancer drugs sold by European firms. These are drugs invented in the United States, heavily subsidized in the United States, now making billions and billions of dollars by German and Swiss firms, not even American firms. And uh, they're, they're triggering all these concerns everybody has about access to medicine and access to cancer drugs. And they're really, really, that's why we're concerned, that's why we're involved. Separately, there's a, a discussion about whether or not in the WTO system, you're allowed to link patent protection to local manufacturing. Now, what's interesting about that case is that the, if it's true that the WTO rules say that you can't do that, then there, sh there, sh there shouldn't be a hearing at all here today. There should not have been a hearing last week at the International Trade Commission. They should just bring a WTO case. They should settle it and use the WTO to resolve the dispute. I think what you're seeing is the U.S. doesn't believe that they can win a case in the WTO on this, on this, on this issue. And that's why you're seeing this resort to these sort of extra uh, WTO, almost extra legal trade pressures that, are, that, that you see playing out. You're trying to see political pressure put into India to do things in its patent law that it appears are in terms of the local manufacturing issue are completely legitimate as far as the WTO. Or, if they're not, you have to ask yourself, why doesn't the U.S. bring a case? At the same time, it turns out the United States has provisions in its own patent law where local manufacturing comes up as a condition. So all of the products that receive federal funds where the invention is connected to that, which is about one in five patents in the cancer area, for example, and it's a significant number of patents in some other parts of the economy, they have local manufacturing requirements connected to the patent. The United States recently also passed a, uh, uh, a new act having to do with subsidies for clean energy batteries, and in that act, it also has a local manufacturing uh, clause as it relates to, to patents and other intellectual property rights. So if the United States really you know, makes this a messy trade dispute, then it also possibly will implicate some of these other areas of U.S. law. I mean, I don't think people know for sure because these are legal questions. But uh, uh, there's all this local manufacturing thing going on, which is a, an important discussion for all countries involved, including countries like India, which are trying to become more developed. And then there's separately all these issues about access to medicine. And uh, they were all playing out this week at the special 301 hearing and last week at the International Trade Commission. We've heard a lot across these last few hearings about um, you know, how the policies in India are going to cause this contagion effect or this, uh, lots of spillover in other countries. Um, do, you, do you think that will happen? And if so, kind of where do you think is next for a lot of these compulsory licenses, um, whether or not those fears are founded? Well, uh, I mean, I, I think when people talk about the contagion, contagion effect, I mean, there's, there's an element of truth to the contagion idea. It's the idea you sort of get, I mean, I mean the, the metaphor, I guess, is almost, almost like you catch a disease or something like that. But, but, but think of it from the U.S. point of view. The U.S. promotes a certain type of intellectual property policies, like we grant patents on second, third, and tenth uses of products. You know, we have all kinds of, it's really easy to get patents in the United States. And we try and propagate that as a norm through, the, through this, actually this proceeding we're in today. The U.S. is trying to force countries to follow our model, in a lot of ways against their will. But, you know, we're trying to propagate that, that norm in a way. And we're trying to do that in copyright field. We're trying to do that on, on uh, uh, the relationship between internet service providers and copyright enforcement. We're trying to do it in a lot of different ways. And What's happening in India, they're afraid will work kind of in the opposite direction. They think that India adopts a policy and demonstrates that you can grant, instead of more patents, fewer patents. India wants to make it harder to get patent on an older drug. The United States wants to make it easier to get a patent on an older drug. They're completely going in different directions. So it's really a question 
who propagates whose norm or what becomes uh, the norm countries want to follow. I think the United States knows that most countries would prefer to follow the Indian norm. They like to have fewer patents on drugs, particularly really expensive drugs like cancer drugs. And so the United States doesn't want people to freely choose to follow the, the, uh, the Indian model. So we use these trade pressures as a way of coercing people using the power of a big economy against smaller countries to get them to do what we want them to do rather than uh, you know, freely choose the system they want, which would probably be, for a lot of them, the Indian model. So um, a lot of countries today, they talked about South Africa as one of the countries that they're really now beginning to target. And uh, it's weird hearing these conversations about South Africa because it's been over 10 years since we've heard people really talk about South Africa in this way. Uh, really since 2001, people have really kind of left South Africa alone after the uh, big trial uh, where the drug company sued, sued uh, the government there. But now you see the, the companies picking a fight with South Africa, again on patents, again on medicine patents. Uh, this time it's not so much AIDS, it's really, the battle's really over cancer drugs.